You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. Finally, welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I am Tom Knezic. Welcome to episode 72. And this time we're going to run it back a little bit. But uh, Shannon, welcome to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast. We were just on your podcast not long ago. Yes, uh, thanks for having me. I think we need to fill everyone in on Fran's blunder. That just happened for the last hour and a half. <laughs> I, you Fran, know, would you like to explain yourself? Or I, w- <laughs> I, sure. You know, we're. I am. In case everyone doesn't hasn't already figured this out, I have OCD to the to the <laughs> millionth level. So when we it, when it's podcast day, I come in early and set up so that if there's any problems, I know hours before we're going to to broadcast or record. Mm-hmm. So today, Zoom made me up or download a, a new version, yeah. and which went, many of our the people yeah. listening probably had the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah, recently, you know, was, right? I knew it was going to happen. You know, of course, I didn't, and it, it downloaded first thing this morning. I'm like, I should be okay. I tested everything, but when I clicked the link to get in, it froze everything, and it it after an hour of restarting computers and and trying everything. <laughs> We're finally here. I'm just so flustered that I'm glad that that Shannon's kind of experienced us already. To <laughs> so, so she's already prepared, but I'm I'm already all out of sorts. I have to get myself together for you today. So so I I'm apologizing up front if I'm out of sorts today. But I'll try to I'll try to get it together for the sake of native plants. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, so that's a, a great lead in is, um, I guess it wasn't really that great of a lead in. No, no it's a horrible <laughs> lead in. <laughs> was it was horrible. Trying to make something out of nothing there. But uh, <laughs> no, we we talked about on our last buzz how we were going to be on uh, Backyard Ecology podcast, which if you guys remember from a way previous buzz that I always dreamed on being a guest on a podcast and then Me it finally too. happened and I was really, really happy about it. But uh, we definitely want to return the favorite because we enjoy listening to the Backyard Ecology podcast. Thanks, Russ Benari from, from PSE&G for keying me in on that one. Yes. And um, and we want to have Shannon on to kind of talk about how she got started or interested in native plants and then started in, in social media and podcasting. So Shannon, I, I suck at intros, so I always let the guests kind of introduce themselves because I don't want to embarrass myself with my lack of knowledge on, on our guests. So roll into the DIY, <laughs> yeah, do it yourself yeah. intro. <laughs> yeah, that works. But yeah, I want to say how honored I am to be on the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast because, like you, Tom, I always kind of dreamed of being on a podcast since I started my own. And now you guys are making it happen for me. So this is great. Yeah. I dreamed on being a podcast so much that I decided to start our own. <laughs> well, if no one else is going to invite me on. I'm just going to do it myself. <laughs> you know what? Maybe we can each start our own podcast, a side yeah. podcast, and invite each other yeah. on. So <laughs> we, can, <laughs> we can all be recurring guests. Yeah, so. re- <laughs> Mm-hmm. just kind of rotate through there you go shannon mm-hmm. you can be in our network and we'll just <laughs> that will give us three and we could just rotate around but no i i appreciate it I, I was so excited i was probably too excited i kind of felt after we finished the podcast with you i kind of felt like oh did we hijack that podcast <laughs> like did we totally do a podcast takeover so i i wanted to first apologize before you introduce yourself <laughs> oh no reason to apologize i fully knew what I was getting myself into when I invited you because I do listen to your podcast as well. So I mean, I did my podcast host duty and I had my list of questions and topics and went into it with the whole premise of, yeah, we're probably not going to talk about three quarters of this. We're just going to go. But that's what I wanted for that podcast episode. It's not kind of what I typically do with it. But that was exactly what I wanted for this one. You guys were awesome. I loved it. And so were you. I thought that was a great, 
a great podcast because we did, we went off in different directions that we probably wouldn't have touched on had we, we stuck to, you, you know, we're always going off and, and sometimes those are our better moments, but it's, it was listening to it because I wanted to go back and listen to it just to see. And it was, I kind of felt like if you're a listener, you were eavesdropping on one of our conversations that was happening behind the scene because it was, I, I kind of felt like it was that natural and that normal that it was kind of like someone just hit record while we were talking and it, and people got to listen. Yes. And that was exactly what I strive for with my um, episodes and the, converse, and the conversations. And you guys just hit it so perfectly with that. And so, yeah, that's what I said. It was it just worked and I loved it. I did too. And, you know, it's one of those things where I, I really believe that you could redo that 10 times and we could start off the same way and it go in 10 different directions. You'd have 10 different yeah. podcasts each time. You just can't. Oh, yes. <laughs> Nothing like being OCD and ADHD at the same time. Just to. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, yes. And I'm so glad to hear you say that because that's exactly me. And I am so glad, I, I'm sorry, friend, but I am so glad those issues happened to you and not me because I would just be so flustered. I don't know if I could jump right back on the mic or not. I, I, you know, I, I, at least it, you know, cause it's working. So I think that's the only saving mm -hmm. grace. Now that I know that at least we're recording a podcast, like I can laugh about it, but mm -hmm. I had to like get up and walk outside for a second and just like take <laughs> a deep breath and just be like, okay, okay, we made it. We're good. But you know, it's, Fortunately, it doesn't happen every week. I, then I guess it would just be no big deal. Be like, eh, same thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So for our listeners that, that maybe oh, yes. haven't listened to Backyard Ecology, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are and a, a little bit about what you do. So my name is Shannon Tromboli, and I am a wildlife biologist by training. And I have always loved being outside and learning about all the critters and chasing the critters and just doing everything outside. I mean, I grew up camping and hiking. I didn't even know what a family vacation was that didn't involve camping at some state park or national park for uh, probably into high school or longer. I mean, that was just what we did. Um, when I grew up next door and kind of behind the house was an old cattle pasture and my family had permission to go over there and explore. And my brother and I took full advantage of that growing up. So I was just always outside. There was never anything else. So of course I went into wildlife biology when I got into college, but along with that was always a passion for teaching people or not really teaching, sharing was more what it was sharing when I was learning. And of course that means teaching, but in an informal setting. So as much as I've done the research and the work in wildlife biology, I've also always had a very strong component of communication and edu informal education and helping people get involved with research and learn about and just inspired by it. So yeah, backyard ecology kind of comes from parts of that, a lot of parts of that. You know, it's it's funny that th there seems to be a common thread with everyone that we talk to, and and there's a passion behind it. And you do what you do because you, you're passionate about. It. There's I haven't met too many people that are doing this but hate what they do. Yeah. That makes I don't sense. think like, you could. Lot, no, there's a lot of other occupations where I talk to people and it's like I hate this. I wish I could do something <laughs> else. I chose the wrong thing. But in our industry, you don't really get that. Yeah. You have people that are really passionate and. But you're, that would be pretty funny. An entomologist uh, who hates insects. Yeah, <laughs> I have to see another insect. Oh, you know. But <laughs> I was joking around. But there are probably entomologists who hate certain types of insects. But mm -hmm. or I'm sure there's a lot of them hate spotted lanternflies, even think, though they are, oh, yes, strangely fascinating. You know, the, I think the funny thing is, is that the biggest complaint I've heard from people in our profession is having to deal with other people. They love that. They just yeah. don't like the interaction with having to deal with what comes along with it, yeah. you know, and, and that's understandable, but it's your average everyday person for the things that we love and love to talk about, they don't know anything about. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, and they may know a plant or two or a bug or two, but they don't, they're not 
as well versed and we just love talking about it. Mm -hmm. So you try to get everyone involved. You want to get people to realize, man, there's, there's all of these things going on right before your eyes that you're not noticing, like just stop and look at this and enjoy this. Yeah. And it's, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I love. And, and so you, you kind of talked about what you do for a living, but backyard ecology isn't what you do for a living. It's what you do because you love it. Right. And yeah, it's getting people with backyard ecology. My real focus is trying to help people appreciate and recognize all of the really cool things that they have in our own local communities with the wildlife, with the plants, with the pollinators, and really inspire and ignite that curiosity that leads to just I've got to know more. I want to know more. And that leads to wanting to, I mean, once you get that appreciation going, that curiosity going, you've just got to keep learning. And then you want to have it in your yard. And so inviting them in and creating that habitat, because we can all do a little bit in our yards and communities, whether your yard is a typical suburban urban lot, or if it's hundreds of acres and my listeners have everything in between. Mm -hmm. Well, how, how did you decide where you wanted to start or what audience you were trying to reach? Like what, you know, because there, there's such a wide range that you could have taken to do this. Mm -hmm. What, what led you to the mission that you're on to do? And maybe talk about what that mission is. Yeah. And it's kind of a long story. Like most stories, it takes a winding path. Um, like I said, I grew up always outside always chasing down different critters, learning about them. I was a total nature geek from the time I was a kid. I can't remember a time when I wasn't that way. And like all kids I, that are into that stuff, I was watching the same shows. I was watching the same um, or reading the same books. I loved reading. Um, but everything talked about zebras and tigers and lions and kangaroos and so I kind of always assumed that all the really cool interesting things were somewhere way out there not here in my own backyard even though that's what I loved learning about on my free time that wasn't worth protecting that was just normal everyday stuff that was normal the exciting cool fun interesting things to learn about and that needed to be preserved were out there in some pristine wilderness, far, far away, at least out West, definitely not where I was growing up in Kentucky. I mean, come on. Um, but, and so I wanted to go as far away as possible to get to those places and do that research. Ended up getting a full ride scholarship to a university here in Kentucky and um, actually had one of the best wildlife programs in the Southeast at the time. So I wasn't stupid, I took it even though I really thought at the time I was going to, in high school, I was going to get as far away as possible. I jumped around doing summer jobs here, there, and everywhere. That was my chance to get away. And I loved Hawaii. Oh my gosh, Hawaii is amazing. I, out West, I loved it up there, out West. I loved um, the potholes, of, the prairie potholes of Canada just all these different places. I really love those summer jobs and they were gorgeous and they were beautiful. And there were so many things to learn, so many new critters, but I always got drawn back to the Eastern US and I never quite understood why. There was just something about it. I loved my deciduous hardwood forest mixed in with the open areas. I loved my rivers and my creeks and my ponds and my lakes. I loved the limestone bluffs. I mean, there's just so many things that just kept drawing me back here. And I really, I mean, when we settled, my husband and I got married and when he settled here, I was happy, but a part of me still felt, I don't know, almost like I was settling because I was here. And remember, all those cool, fun things that I dreamed about studying were out there somewhere else. And then somewhere early on, I think my husband and I were married. We may not have been quite married yet, but I think we were, it was early in our marriage. We were visiting his family in Indiana. 
And it just so happened that some of his distant cousins were visiting from Australia, of all places. They were visiting from Australia. <laughs> now, Australia is one of those really cool, fun places that has all the interesting things worth studying, right? <laughs> yeah. And worth learning about. So I was totally excited. And I mean, all I wanted to talk about was the wildlife and stuff. And his cousins weren't quite as interested in that stuff as I was. But of course, that was their backyard, too. That was normal for them. And his grandparents took us out to eat. We came out from eating. And it was a beautiful summer evening right at dusk. And the parking lot was completely lit up with hundreds and hundreds of flashing, twinkling fireflies. It's a scene I've seen a million times. And I always stop and am amazed by it whenever I see that. Because I love fireflies. Always have. But the younger cousin, distant cousins who were middle school age-ish were really shocked and a little bit taken aback and a little nervous. They'd never seen anything like that. They weren't sure what was going on, which just totally shocked me because I cannot imagine a life without fireflies. No, I can't either. No. I mean, they're just, I chased them since I was a kid. And notice I said, I've chased them because I still chase them <laughs> in the backyard. <laughs> and so, of course, I had to teach them how to catch fireflies. And we ran around the parking lot chasing fireflies and then back at his grandparents' house chasing fireflies for a while. But as I turned into a big kid again, but that was one of those situations that just really started to awaken something in me because I realized that, wait a minute. We have cool, fun things here. And it was just this kind of progressive process after that, as I became more and more aware of all those things I just taken for granted in my own yard and how cool and interesting they are and began to learn how much we don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, there is so much that we don't know about our local wildlife because everybody does the same thing I did at all levels. And as I realized both for myself and my own personal journey, and then I started noticing other people and becoming aware of everybody else doing the same thing I had done. I was like, no, 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 no. We got to do something about this. And so that's kind of progressively what led to the mission that I'm on now to really help people appreciate and enjoy their own local ecological communities, the wildlife, the pollinators, the native plants, how it all works together and just ignite that curiosity and everybody else. The, the nice thing about it, and I, I can't speak for you, but I'm, I'm going to assume it's the same that Tom and I found that once you start doing the podcast, it's infectious and yes. because it, it sparks something in yourself. You're trying to spark something in the listener, but like with the guests that we choose, we keep learning more and more and you become a sponge and you're like, what else, what else can we find out about? What else can we learn about? And it's, and you're passing that along because your curiosity is sparking your listeners curiosity. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit on so many things. It's this past weekend for the first time, my, my fiance Agatha and I were taking a drive and I can't remember where we're at. And I'm like, you know what? I realize I'm a Jersey boy. Like, even though I wasn't born here, I've, I've spent the last 22, 23 years here, but I was born in PA, maybe only 15 minutes drive from New Jersey. It was right on the Delaware River. So I spent most of my, pretty much all of my life within an hour of here. And now that I'm in New Jersey, I like, and you start experiencing all the things that we've talked about and all the great things that we have locally that mm -hmm. maybe I didn't appreciate before. Like it took me this long in my life to realize, wow, we have the Pine Barrens and we have the beach and we have the Sourlands and we have all these great things in the water gap and uh, all these things that maybe I didn't have an appreciation for before. And I'm like, not only that, we're only an hour and a half away from the Chesapeake Bay. We're mm -hmm. only mm -hmm. an hour and a half away from the Poconos or we're only this, you know, we're so centrally located. And then we started talking and Agatha's like, well, if you could live anywhere, where would you live? And I'm like, I, I don't know. I like, li I like living here. And she was saying, she goes, if, if it were anywhere, I'd want to stay 
where there's four seasons and maybe even further north. She's like, I could see myself living in Connecticut or Minnesota or something like that, you know, and it's, Mm -hmm. it's just funny what you grow accustomed to and realize it's, it's a part of you. And it's, it took me almost 51 years to realize that, but it's, it's funny that path that realizing, Hey, what about, right. You know, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen the same commercials where it's like, we have to save the tigers and you're like the tigers. What about the quail? Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know there's so many things here that we're losing. Why are you focusing, you know, not saying yeah. they're not noble causes. All of these things are noble mm-hmm. causes, but there's so many things right in your backyard that you can be a part yeah. of. That was something mm-hmm. I, I realized a, a little bit before I had my son was that we focused on like the, the phrase that I use a lot is charismatic African megafauna. It's the elephants, it's the giraffes, it's the the lions, it's these larger animals that uh, we don't care about the little the little prairie mouse that's running around on the savanna. We don't care about that at all, but we do care about the lion. We do care about the elephant. They're living at the same habitat, but um, yeah, we didn't really pay any attention to our native wildlife. Um, although it's become a little bit more trendy recently, like yeah. the the little yes. outdoor bear woods theme buffalo plat, and that is describing my my son's bedroom too (laughs) and um but yeah we aren't you aren't going to uh uh, well toys r us is closed you aren't going to a toy store and finding an opossum stuffed animal (laughs) like you aren't finding you're finding a firefly stuffed animal anything like that um maybe at like a a zoo they might have something like that but uh yeah we pay so much attention to these other things so that was one of my main stressors is Hey, we when we're getting stuffed animals, let's get them stuff that's native to here. When we're getting toys, let's get them stuff that's native to here. It's really hard to turn down, and we haven't turned down when your friend gets a toy for the baby and it's a sloth or something <laughs> like that. Or, oh, at least that's a little bit more creative. But uh, yeah, so you don't turn down the stuff that's. But I I made a, a conscious effort to only get things that that resided around us. Um, and that's still ignoring the insects and, and the really tiny things that you don't pay as much attention to. But yeah. I know any book that's on his bookshelf is going to be about hippos and, and lions and tigers and giraffes and elephants and those kind of things. It doesn't have a story about uh, the deer that's in the backyard or, or the raccoon or something like that. So, no, it's a, it's a really important topic that you we have all this stuff right here. It's right. All you do, have, no matter where you live, all you have to do is walk outside Look. and you will see some kind of wildlife, which I right. think is a perfect yeah. tie in, like go into your own backyard, the ecology in your own backyard, mm-hmm. regardless of where your backyard is, yeah. you should you should get to know what is happening right, right in front of you. Right. And my listeners know full well, my listeners and my readers, because I have a blog and a podcast right now dream of expanding out to YouTube station eventually, but only so much at one time. I'm very bad about jumping in and trying to do everything because of course there's 50 million hours in a single day and I can do it all at once. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I'm trying not to be, to do that as much. It's, I really fight that, but with the blog and the podcast, I mean, the people that listen to me or read me know that I define backyard very, very, very loosely. Mm -hmm. I mean, front yard, backyard, um, backyards, like I said, or yards can be small, typical Mm -hmm. yard, or it can be hundreds and hundreds of acres. And it doesn't matter. You know, for, for people to understand how passionate people like you are for listeners, Again, this is something that isn't your job. How many hours a week do you think you you put into between the blog and the podcast and your website and social media? Oh my gosh. Just with the backyard ecology stuff. I would say I'm down to easily 24 hours a week, sometimes more. I've cut that back. Um, I was when I first started the podcast, doing the blog and the podcast both every week. And yeah, that was way too much. So I dropped back and started alternating the two and I've gotten faster on my editing for the podcast. So it's getting a little bit less, but, but it's all because it's what you're passionate about Mm -hmm. and it's, and, and passionate about incorporating other people into it. I know Tom and I originally were doing every other week 
uh, when we started, the only way we, possible that we could do every week was to do buzz episodes where it's just mm -hmm. Tom and I, because prep preparing for a guest every week, if you want to do a good job, it takes a lot of time. It does. You Which know. the the idea for the buzz episodes was to make them like half an hour or less. It was like real <laughs> short form, and that went out the window within like two or three episodes. I we think, couldn't we I, couldn't cut ourselves off. I think the first episode was like forty minutes, mm -hmm. and since then we've only gotten it to an hour one time. Yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, even those have evolved. But at least, and and they even take a fair amount of preparation because we're doing the current events, what's hot, and this or that, and and having a topic and uh, so there's just not enough hours in the day but you find time because you feel you feel strongly about the message mm -hmm. that you're trying to share and I, I think if you're not consistent about it that the people that you're trying to reach aren't consistent about how they feel about it mm -hmm. you know so I think consistency is a bit a huge a huge part of it but when did when did you know that you had something when did you know that you stumbled upon something after you started like oh my god people people want to hear this people are listening well i had done about five or six years ago i had started writing a small blog called kentucky pollinators and wildlife okay. and it was just basically for local friends friends of friends those sorts of things that was just giving tips about how to attract pollinators and wildlife to your yard, talking about some of them, just various things like that, highlighting native plants and what pollinators and wildlife use those. And that had kind of, I mean, it had grown, but not huge. And one thing that I noticed as time went on was that I was starting to get a larger reading. Uh, lar larger readership where they weren't all from Kentucky. I was getting more Tennessee people and more Indiana and stuff like that. And then I decided to, I, I was looking for how to build an add-on because I wasn't getting the reach that I wanted to get just because I wanted to share. I mean, like you said, I'm so passionate about it. So I decided, okay, with the broader audience, let me expand maybe i need to expand out and not just have it so kentucky centric and about that time i started listening to podcasts myself because i was doing a lot of traveling and i was like oh this could be fun and decided to, okay started thinking about it i'm going to focus on the eastern u.s because if you're going to have backyard ecology and really focus on that local you have to have local mm -hmm. and we're i mean just within the Eastern US, we're so different and there's so much variety, but there's enough similarity that we can also work together. When you get to someplace like Utah, and I know I've got listeners in Utah, we change so much what we can find in our yards and our local communities. I was like, I, I don't have the expertise. I'm not the person to talk a lot about that. So I'm going to go ahead and focus on the Eastern US. And that's when I was like, okay, I'll start the podcast. I'll rebrand the blog into Backyard Ecology. So I've got both going on. And immediately, it really exploded um, what I was seeing with the audience on both. They really expanded. When you look at the backyard, look at podcasting and the stats and stuff, I mean, I look at the stats, I'm like, why would anybody ever start a podcast? What was I even thinking <laughs> with that? Um, and we're thinking how many people have podcasts as well. You know, because <laughs> yes. it, it, it does seem overwhelming. There's a million choices. There are, but there wasn't a lot in this field, really, that I could find, which is why I was like, okay, yeah, I, it's needed. And that's why I decided to start. But yeah, my, my stats, I mean, I'm not hitting a million readerships or any or a million listens or anything like that. I haven't gotten to the 50,000 downloads like you guys have, but I'm not doing bad at all. I think for where I'm at in the field that we're in, because none of us are probably going to hit a million downloads every single episode. That's like the top no. 3%. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's a scary thing when you start because you have to think in your head, someone wants to hear what we have to say. We have something valuable to offer. But then you put it out there and you hear nothing. And 
Yes. You know, and it's like, well, does anyone think like we think we have something valuable to say? Does anyone really think we have something valuable to say? So I think early on, Tom, we're like, well, we're not the experts, but we're going to let you talk to the people that are the experts. And it takes a little bit of the pressure off of, <laughs> of at least like how you feel about it. But yes, exactly. Uh, and that was one of the things with the podcast versus the blog, the blogs. I'm more of the expert. I'm synthesizing the information, but with the podcast, one of the things I wanted to do was bring in those experts, bring in the researchers, bring in the people that are studying and working with this stuff and talk to them more um, as much because I wanted to geek out and learn more than anything. I also wanted to share it obviously with others and help get that information out there. But like you were saying earlier, I wanted to learn from people myself. And this was an opportunity for me to not only learn, but also share that knowledge. Yeah. And it's, you know, I think some of the feedback that we got early on and, and you forget that not everyone is starts at the same spot with mm -hmm. learning too. So, you know, how do you take what we do and have a conversation that's relatable to everyone so that someone can get something out of it. We had people like early on saying, when you talk about a plant and you say the botanical, can you say the common name too? Because we don't know what you're talking about. And it's like, oh yeah, I even think about, you know, I'm in work mode and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm doing work things, but not everyone comprehends that. And then on top of it, a, a lot of our, especially early on guests were, were work relationships that we had too. So we, are talking on a not a day to day basis, but More a month personal. to month. Or we're yeah. talking, we're talking on a through work jargon already. So it was almost mm -hmm. like a, just another conversation. We just happen to be recording this one, and um, yeah. So they're oh yeah, they're, it's even though they would normally if they're talking to a group that that was starting off at a, a more beginner spot, they didn't when they're talking to us they aren't taking that into account it was right. a lot of the people that we've had on that was like the first time they'd ever been on a podcast yeah so it's fun mm -hmm. to see them go on some other podcasts at least at least some of them after we'd had them on that was cool but but one of the things i applaud you for shannon is that your podcast is a podcast that anyone can start listening mm -hmm. to at any point and definitely pull something from that and get something out of that and get excited and and i can't say that when we when we've listened to other native plant podcast i can't say that you always get sometimes they're a little too stuffy sometimes they're a little too technical so there's a fine balance to get someone interested and to the point where they're attentive enough that they're learning and i feel that you do that very well you're you're Thank a you. prime example of the best way to do that thanks and that's where i think my interest and background of also doing science communication for so long really comes into play because I'm able to bring in more of those techniques and stuff. And I, I'm like you, I go back and forth between scientific and common names, but I'm more familiar with when I'm talking to the public. I, it's just very common for me to go straight to common names. Mm -hmm. And I've done so much education work that that really comes into play. But like you were saying, that first time on the podcast for a lot of the guests and stuff, that's part of why it takes me so long to do all the editing work. <laughs> I spend way more time on editing because I want everybody to look good and I want it to be relatable mm -hmm. to everybody else, which means we have the, okay, uh -uh, go back, explain that in another, uh, explain that easier <laughs> <laughs> conversations that nobody hears about. Yeah, because it's just that's what we need to do. <laughs> it's important and it's important topics. One of the things from my experience before we did this, I had a couple music podcasts and you think, you know, no one really seemed interested. So if they didn't seem interested in that. Why would they be interested in this? And then it's not about me. It's the topic. And mm -hmm. and, you know, with music, any musician at this point is so immersed in social media. If you love the certain band or musician, you can hear them talk on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook and get all the all the information you want directly from the source. Plants don't have their own social media. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if you want to learn about them, you have to go to someone that can help guide you. And it's more not tell you about them, but guide you. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the niche that you're really hitting that you're an incredible guide into 
the world that you don't see when you walk out your door. Yeah. And that's, that's important. That's really important. And it's, it takes a special person to do that because mm -hmm. I'm not that good at it. I'm good <laughs> at having people on like you, <laughs> that yeah. can do it, but I'm not good at it. So I appreciate the talent that you have for that and that you're able to put that in a podcast, put that in a blog. So I, I, I applaud you for, <laughs> for that. Thanks. So we, I, I touched on social media. How important do you think for, for is social media to what we're doing or, or for restoration in general, the podcasts that are out and, and the social media work, how important do you think that is to you or in general? I think communication is the important part and the social media, the podcast, all of that are different ways to communicate. So it's the getting out there and opening people's eyes, helping them to see uh, whether that's an in-person, oh, cool, come on, you got to look at this and dragging them down on the trail to see this really cool thing that you just found, uh, whether that's catching fireflies in the middle of the parking lot with somebody that's never seen fireflies before, whether that is a uh, podcast, whether that's a social media um, interaction. It's that communication, helping people learn, helping people get inspired and interested and igniting that curiosity so that they want to learn. I mean, we learn lots of things in school, but that doesn't mean we keep learning once we, those topics, once we leave that class or get out of school, but it's inspiring that interest, which starts with communication. But the problem with social media, I mean, social media is awesome. And it's a way to get to a lot of people. But one of the problems I also see with it is that, and we talked about this a little bit on um, our episode of the Backyard Ecology podcast. So often you see these extremes. Yes. You have to be this and you have to do everything perfectly. And it has to be this way or no, you can't be doing anything. You're just causing more problems. And that none of us respond to that. No. And I think that we really need to find that balance. And for me, that's the important part is finding that balance between especially our homes and our properties and the more broader pristine conservation areas, which we manage those very differently, those natural areas versus our homes, um, recognizing that everybody's coming in at a different place, whether that's knowledge levels, whether that's interests, whether that is just amount of land that they can do anything with. We've all got different locations. And I'm the first one to say, I am not perfect. I have invasive species on my property. We're working towards getting the, rid of them. We're not planting more, obviously. But we've still got them. I haven't gotten rid of all of them. Probably never will. It's a never ending job. I've got non-natives that are on our property. Some we've inherited, some I've brought in. Why? Because they're not harming anything. I've got enough of everything else. And I'm not out there planting them in the woods. This is around my home, which is different. I mean, there's that balance and everybody's balance points different. So communication is really important and welcoming people in like that, I think is the important thing. And the podcast, the social medias, the blogs, all of that are just different ways to do that. You know, I think it's a good point. Like if it's, if it becomes so much of a chore, not a lot of people are going to want to do it. Like mm -hmm. hey, you have to yeah. do this, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I'm like, oh, that's another job. I don't, I don't want to do all that. There's got to be a sense of and, wonder. To and it. when you're yes. getting into it and you're hearing the 17 different ways to do it and which one's actually right, which are not necessarily even which one's right, which one's right for that individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes a big, big difference. And there's, uh, yeah, we've given into social media here <laughs> way too much in our, our disdain for it, but how important it is at the same time. I, I think nobody likes to have to do anything. Oh, yeah. No, it doesn't matter if it's chores or doing something outside. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think. And I felt this way for over 30 years. There's always been a stigma too with the horticultural industry that it's something that 
anyone can be a part of in their own yard. They can grow a plant from seed if they choose to, and they have, like it's one of the first things you learn in school. So everyone thinks they know a lot about it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I don't mean that in a negative way, but like I've had people explaining to me how I should be doing things. I'm like, you realize I do this for a living? Like I do, <laughs> you know, but everyone has a strong opinion and it's just mm -hmm. like, you can say, this plant doesn't live here. Like you can, you can have an iris say it's really only native to here in this zone and be like, I had an ant in Northern Alaska that had one that lived for 25 years, you know? And it's like, okay, like, I understand that there's always things, but it's, it's hard when it's a topic that I think a lot of people don't put a lot of credibility into the education behind it and the science behind it. And it's, mm -hmm. that's, what's hard. There's mm -hmm. a lot of people that think they're experts that give their advice like experts but they're not necessarily an expert mm -hmm. or giving good advice. Yeah. And it's hard. Who's right. Who's, yeah. You know, Tom, Tom has talked to, we haven't talked about this for a long time, but there's Facebook groups where there's people that we consider experts that have been banned from groups yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for giving yeah. advice that people just didn't like mm -hmm. that are experts in the yeah. field. And they were banned. <laughs> they were <laughs> banned and they were giving it in a kind way. Yes. It wasn't, they were being for free. Like, then they, they're usually getting paid for this advice and they're giving it for free online. And yeah, literally. And this wasn't just one or two people. This was like a new numerous, <laughs> was quite a few in different groups across different kinds of things. Yeah. I was really surprised when I was like, this is, I don't want to say who it is, but I'm like, this is like a legend in this sphere. And he's getting told he's wrong by. So yeah. just a backyard gardener. Yeah. And yeah, it was, I was like, I wonder how many people actually know who this guy is. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, so it was interesting. You have to present it in a point that someone's receptive mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. say, maybe the way I was taught isn't, you know, and it's all about perception. It's all about how you're taught. We're all taught how to do things incorrectly our entire lives, you know, and it's starting to think, oh, you know, I've been doing this. Maybe I need to make changes because I see a different picture now, you know, and it, you can't, my, I just had to have a, a whole conversation with my 18 year old son about, you know, he, he was bad mouthing, um, hybrid cars and how everything should be like, like V8s like back, you know, and it's <laughs> like, I, I didn't even attempt to really have the conversation in full because I know he wasn't ready to comprehend that conversation. I, I was not going to change his mind. And I chose not to have the argument, <laughs> but I, I, hopefully I planted a few seeds that eventually one day he'll see things differently, mm -hmm. but it's, you can't, you can't make people learn if they don't want to learn and you can't, you, you, you just have to find a way that you can, that you can present it in a way that people can maybe come away with something different from it. Yeah. And that's very difficult. And mm -hmm. I'm so we're, we're doing this again, where we're making it about us, Fran. <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> what we do? I was just at a, a conference yesterday for the New Jersey Nursery and Landscape Association, where I had like a really, really good native plant curriculum with uh, Randy Echo from Toad Shade Nursery, who is like one of, the, maybe one of the more impactful women in the native yeah. plant movement. Uh, I shouldn't even say, say women, one of the more impactful people, people. in the native yeah. plant, plant movement. And um, uh, then Rick McCoy, who's been on this podcast and a number of times, who's focused on native plants and organic lawn care. And then, uh, and then Dr. Doug Talamy is the keynote. And as I'm sitting there and I'm watching, and I shouldn't, I should also mention Bruce Crawford from uh, formerly Rutgers, Rutgers Cooperative yeah. Extension yeah. in Rutgers Garden. Now he's with, a, I can't exact, I don't remember who went, but, uh, and he gave a presentation about how to use native plants just in your own landscape and for more than just for aesthetics for heating and cooling your houses and like, keeping your house cooler in the summer and hotter or warmer in the winter those and all different things but the one thing missing from all these presentations was well, why is it important why yeah i get it's important for this spotted leaf question mark skipper <laughs> but why is it important to me like yeah if the skippers go away what 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 impact does it have on me that was what was missing from all those messages was um in my mind was okay yeah it's important for our environment it's important for our ecology or wildlife but if that yeah if i don't if i don't leave the leaves so oh, yeah so what how does that hurt me and i think that's that's a hard message to convey 
because it, is. it affects people in so many different ways. Yeah, it is. And it's one that I struggle with too. And that's why the only way that I personally found to be able to even begin to comprehend that because, or to do anything about it, because until people have that connection, it's not, it, it's that, okay, yeah, so what, how's that hurt me um, attitude um, mm -hmm. that we all have about everything. But that's why I try so hard to really instill that sense of wonder and engagement and that connection. Because once we have that connection about anything, whether it's the fireflies or the Carolina wrens or the tiger swallowtails or anything like that, until we have that connection and it's like, oh, I can't imagine life without that. I love seeing that. That makes me happy. Or whether it's a hybrid car. I mean, it yeah. doesn't, or, or a computer. I, it doesn't matter until we have that connection. None of us are really going to care about anything or do anything about it. So for me, it starts with being able to instill that wonder and that curiosity and that, oh, I've got to learn more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have, have you gotten any negative feedback? Has that, I'm always curious because we, you know, we don't get much, but we have. You got one one star. <laughs> yeah, we got we the got, one one star, and, and Fran cried about it for. We got so he's still crying. We got two <laughs> one stars actually. One person just was vocal about it; the other one wasn't. So, <laughs> and which is fine. And I'm I'm literally okay with that. But I'm just curious if you've encountered any negative feedback. I really haven't had a whole lot. I've had one three star review, but I don't know what they just left the left the stars. So I don't know if it's something that I can fix and make better and or not be able to it. You know, I, I think yeah. with some of the, the negative feedback we got, we were never going to be the type of podcast that this person wanted. Exactly. And that's why and I that's what... understand that the negative feedback. It's like, I kind of feel like we're offering something. It may not be in a form that you like it, but if you don't like it, just kind of go find one that you like. Yeah. You know, and I just feel like some people are a little, <laughs> a little nasty about it. Yeah. But yeah. You know, me on the other hand, I don't really care. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, and that's one of the important things I think I'd stress is like we, and we've said it a bunch of times about our podcast. And I know you're the same way as Jen where, yeah, we've only like, we set out thinking maybe, yeah, we might get like 25 listens, but that was enough. And we'd mm -hmm. still do it because that's yeah. enough of a difference. And yeah, we want it to grow. And yeah. like, we're ecstatic about how much it's grown, but we are doing it because we thought it was a good way to get that message out. And whether it was 25 people or hundred people or whatever it turned into, it was, that was enough to do it. We needed, yeah. we felt we needed to do this anyway. I would still feel the same way about what, yeah. what we've done and what we're doing. If no one was listening, mm -hmm. because I'm still excited about, you know, yeah. you hope you're, you're making a, a difference in someone's life so it's nice to see that people are listening mm -hmm. but yeah if, if if it were 25 listeners and it, one week it went to 26 i'd be like yes yes <laughs> yes <laughs> oh yes exactly and i mean i love getting the feedback from people and getting the emails and the facebook messages that yeah this went really really well or um i really like this talk about this more talk about that more and yeah i mean that's it's that engagement. It's that next step. It's that it's part of communication. I mean, we can all three sit here and blabber all day long. And yes, it's great to get our messages out there, but if nobody's listening, we're not communicating well. Yes. And so, and communication is not just us blabbering. It's also getting that engagement. It's a two-way conversation. It just may not all happen on air. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> It's and and we're not above getting better at what we do. We want to, we all want to be better at how we present it or do better. So we appreciate the feedback, even if it's negative. You know, right? You uh, learn more from negative feedback than you do from positive feedback. The positive feedback just gives us, makes us feel better and lets us know that we're on the right track. 
Like well, most I'm of it. I'm going to stop asking for positive feedback. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I want all the positive feedback I can get. <laughs> yeah, I just try I, and remember with the negative that I can learn something from it. There's usually something there if that you I can negative learn. feedback, yeah. do it in the form of a five-star review. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. That's a great way to get <laughs> yeah. our attention. You know, but it, we do listen because we've made changes to the podcast as time has gone on. Like mm -hmm. it's, it's not in the original format. It's actually evolved. Like it's not like. I know we've talked about it before, but if you go back and listen to like the first 10 podcasts, it's like, ugh. <laughs> you know, but it was part of the evolution to to get where you're at and be able to spread the message that you're at. So mm -hmm. it, you have to start somewhere, just like we talk, we have to start somewhere, if, if anywhere with native plants, it, it starts and it evolves. So that's a perfect, we're, we're all still evolving. Mm -hmm. So, oh yeah. Um, do you, so we talked about just kind of like the public um, and the perception. Do you feel that, for what you do for a living um, and in the restoration field or community that there is a more sense of community since these things have started to occur more naturally? I think so in many ways, yes. Or at least I am, I'm more aware of it. Okay. Uh, and so I, it's one of those, you don't know what you didn't know. So I'm not sure if it was always there and I just wasn't aware and a part of it, or if it's, kind of coinciding with so many of these podcasts and everything taking off. But yes, I am much more aware of the different communities. And a lot of that comes from talking to different podcast guests, having other people on, um, listening to other podcasts. So I didn't know about Kyle and I'm not a TikTok person. Uh, that's just not me. So I never would have run into him until I you guys mentioned him, and then I heard your last interview with him, which was awesome. I really enjoyed that. But um, yeah, now I've got, I'm on the Facebook, I joined the Facebook group so I can see what he puts there. Yeah. And I've got a resource now that I can send people that I know who enjoy TikTok and are part of that community. I can go, oh, hey, go listen to this. I think you'll really enjoy this. And being able to share that community around. And I think more of us are, or at least I feel like I'm becoming more connected, both from podcast guests, other podcasts that I'm listening to, and my listeners themselves writing it, writing me, emailing me and say, hey, have you heard about? And sometimes it's, oh, yeah, blah, 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 blah. And sometimes it's, no, that's interesting. <laughs> I've got to learn more. Yeah, it, you know, and it's, you know, it's fun watching like someone like Kyle, like we talked about, and, and all of a sudden do a post on TikTok about something that we had a conversation about and watch it explode, yeah. you know, and it makes you wonder, it's like, like you said, it's like, is there more of a community or was I just not part of the community? And now, now yeah. I'm, I'm actively trying to be a part of it. And, and to see all these people that I've got to meet through doing this and, and watch it explode. Like Kyle did a, a post on, on how native plants should be at the white house and it was amazing. And to see the amount of views, I was like, wow, mm -hmm. that is, man, what a great way to spread that message. Like, mm -hmm. and it's, it's fun to be part of, part of that community. So it's, I, I agree with you. It's, I don't know if it was always there or it's, it's becoming just larger because of what we do, but I love the community that's out there because we all really rely on each other and depend on each other to do this. So, and, and that's one of the things that I think going back to your question about social media and podcasts and stuff, I think that's one of the positives mm -hmm. of them is that it, because of those things and because of the technology that we have today, we are able to connect more and create those larger communities where we can all help each other out and learn from each other and just benefit each other. Mm -hmm. um, because of that, where we kind of done that 20, 30 years ago, or not done it as easily. No, and it's a nice network because we're all in different parts of the country as well. So it's mm -hmm. it's easy to say, hey, where are you located? You, you probably want to listen or talk to Shannon, or mm -hmm. if you're over mm -hmm. here, you want to talk to this person. Mm -hmm. It's it's easy. But before I forget, one thing that you do have in common with Kyle, you also have a native plant nursery. Yes. At, at your property as well. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? I'd like sure. you to promote that. Sure. Yeah. It's a very, very small native plant nursery. I literally start all my plants or most of my plants I start in the basement. Mm -hmm. 
and January or February under glow, grow lights and on mats. Um, some of them I actually will plant outside and let do a natural winter. Um, but a lot of them I'll start inside, move everything outside once the weather warms up sometime in April and hope we don't get that late freeze like we have for the past couple of years. Um, but move them all outside, grow them up that way. I do... I, I say mine's a mostly native plant nursery. Um, uh, it's all plants native, well, all plants that benefit pollinators and wildlife. 99.999999% yeah. of the time, it's going to be native to the state of Kentucky when I'm growing. On rare occasions, I might have one or two species that are either native to close by surrounding states, but maybe not necessarily Kentucky, or it's something that is, um, will benefit pollinators a little bit, but may not be native, i.e. I grew too many herbs for my garden. I've got some extra ones here. Somebody wants some extra basil, um, those sorts of things to, again, add those extra entrance points for people, give them something more familiar maybe, but most of the time it's going to be native. And I clearly tell people, what the differences are between them on those rare occasions when I have something else. Going back to, to social media was, uh, was <laughs> there was a whole big debate. I can't, I don't remember what group it was and I wouldn't even say it anyway, but uh, on what actually qualified as a native plant nursery. And if they sold like one non-native thing, did it, well, could you call them the native plant nursery? <laughs> and they were going, like it was, and it was just all out craziness you're, on. You're focusing on the wrong thing. And it's like, as, yeah. yeah. If it's up to the nursery that they don't market non-natives as native that yeah we yes, don't want right. that happening but it's okay for a nursery to have some non-native stuff that's like if they have vegetable starts man that's a, a great thing to offer in addition to native plants right and that's, that's why I, not not a native nursery it's yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And in a lot of general conversations, I just say, yeah, native plant nursery and let it go. Um, when I'm talking to groups that are more native plants, I'm more careful because I've seen things like that erupt. And it's like, I no, please don't get mad at me because I may one year and five have something that's not technically native. Yeah. Uh, but, and just have like, that is a very, very small percentage of what I've got anyway, even plant wise. But yeah, so I, I, I'm like you, I, most of the time I just say native plant nursery. Other times when I'm in more specific groups, I'm a little bit more cautious as to how I classify myself. It's a shame that you have to do that because <laughs> it is. If you're not saying, Hey, this plant is native, you know, when it's not, which you're not doing, mm -hmm. you know, it shouldn't be, you know, we need, with one thing that you always hear is there needs to be more places that are doing native plants, especially yeah. local provenance native plants. You want to applaud that and encourage that and not try to define it. It's just mm -hmm. the focus is really on the wrong thing. Yeah. It's and, and from a nursery end of things, I, I hate going off too far off topic again, but <laughs> from a nursery end of things, the consumer has to remember they're not the only person who's buying plants here too. And like, even in with Pineland nursery, we have stuff that, yeah, it might not necessarily be native or just about everything's native in New Jersey, but yeah. we have stuff that's native a little bit further south because we have customers that are a little bit further south. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have stuff that's maybe it's native to northern New Jersey and then New York and Connecticut and up into Maine, but it's not native to South Jersey. So, but we have customers that are up there. So if you're from South Jersey and you have a project there and you're coming in and saying, oh, this isn't native to South Jersey. Well, there's, yeah, we don't, there aren't just serving South Jersey. We have a very broad uh, customer base so yeah that's another thing to consider as a consumer <laughs> that it's not just for you it's for a whole bunch of people and shannon what's the name of your nursery busy bee nursery and consulting all right awesome and is it by appointment only or can can someone it's, just in? i do open houses at the nursery by appointment okay and i do by appointment open houses so i'll like schedule an actual day okay. and have the time and i do that because what I found is a lot of people, at least within my local driving area, they're still in the more beginning versus more expert stage. So having that time where I can have that dedicated conversation with them and they know that they've got a half an hour block and 
there may be wiggle room if I don't have another appointment right after or whatever, but they've got at least a half an hour block where we can talk about what they need to talk about and answer those questions. And they don't have to worry about anybody else feeling like they're being rushed or anything like that. that's really valuable and goes back to my, my emphasis and focus on education a lot and being able to provide that. I also do deliveries um, during the growing season to a couple of the towns around. It will be just a, you will make the order. I'll come to a certain spot on a certain day. I'll have everything set out on different tables. Come pick up your order, do that sort of thing. And then I do a lot of special events, um, going to community events and stuff and setting up there. I don't know how you find the time yeah. to do all this. It's amazing. I'm, I don't know either. I like Sometimes I, <laughs> I, I feel like I can't complain about anything. Like whenever I'm like, oh man, I got so much going on. I don't have anything going on. I, you don't know how you complain about it? Because you sure do complain. <laughs> <laughs> not that i want to complain <laughs> but given this you still have your your full-time job as well that that you still love what what is it that you still amazes you about what you do for a living what what is your favorite part of of your everyday job well i have to say right now in between everyday day jobs oh, okay all right um, doing lots of different things right now to kind of fill in figure out what that next um everyday job is but what I do know is it's going to allow me to get outside and enjoy nature myself because, well, how can I not have a job that does that? And it's going to involve education and helping people enjoy and learn about and appreciate the nature around them. Because again, that's a part of me that makes my heart sing. And I can't imagine having a job that doesn't allow me to do those things in one form or another. The details can vary, but. It's, you know, it's, it's funny. And I don't know if I've ever said this on the podcast before, but working for a nursery for all the positives, sometimes certain parts of the year are so busy that it kind of, you forget to enjoy the time of the season. Like spring can be mm -hmm. so crazy. Oh yes. That you're so busy. You forget to actually enjoy it. And mm -hmm. that's, you know, there's things that you're doing that are enjoyable, but just the, the time of the year itself you don't necessarily feel you have the time or, or you just don't take the time to stop mm -hmm. <laughs> and go outside and just see, wow, look at what's happening right now. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, that was one of the things that really pushed me to change my blog and podcast from doing both every week to alternating them through because this year I, I just started the podcast in uh last december late november early december of last year of 2020 and then the blog like i said had evolved from the other from what i'd been doing before but this this spring between trying to do the blog and the podcast and an interview style podcast with a guest every week and all the editing that went with that while i was still trying to learn because so it just i mean you learning curve yeah. It's steep. Whenever you're learning something, it takes forever to do. So I had that going on. I was trying to do the nursery and keep everything going there. Um, I was, I'm also a beekeeper. So, and spring's the busiest season for bees. Um, just all these little things that I was doing. It was ridiculous. I was so stressed out. I was working from literally dawn until nine or 10 o'clock at night, trying to get stuff done still feeling like I never could get anything done. I completely missed the spring wildflowers. I never got to go out and do the hikes and the walks that I love to do. And I look forward to doing every single year because it was just, no, I couldn't do it. I, no, 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 no. Yeah. And finally, I just said, no, I can't. And that's when I started dropping things out and switched the podcast to an alternating schedule. And I was like, I've got to have time for me. And I'm still crazy busy. And I, I still like you, I forget sometimes, but I was like, no, I've got to start making time and trying to. And I actually had a lot of my listeners and readers respond and say, thank you hmm. wow. for doing that, for dropping back, because they were seeing the same thing. They couldn't keep up with everything I was putting out and go out and enjoy everything. And they couldn't believe I was even trying to do it. <laughs> 
Yeah. You know, and it, it's tough sometimes juggling it when it, when you're doing it that much and that quick and you want to be able to enjoy the moment too. When you have a guest on, you want to be able to enjoy having that guest. And I remember mm-hmm. early on, I used to get really nervous because I'm like, um, we're having this person on and they're an expert and I don't want to sound like an idiot. So mm-hmm. like you're doing extra research to make sure like, and you're, you're, you're stressing, but you want to enjoy it. Like you want at the end of it, you want to be able to say this was enjoyable. And that just takes time. Mm-hmm. That's like, mm-hmm. like you were saying, like when you're learning to do something, it just takes time to get comfortable and you work out all the kinks. And fortunately we're to the, I, I don't get nervous anymore. That's not a reflection on any of the guests. It's just, I feel comfortable mm-hmm. at least now that I can enjoy it. Like I'm, I'm truly enjoying this conversation. There were ones that I forgot to enjoy. Yes. So, and that's hard too, you know, and it's, it's, it can be overwhelming and I have a tendency to want to do everything right now. So, so, so the fact that you took a step backwards is phenomenal because it's, it's a hard decision to make. Mm-hmm. That was one of the hardest decisions I've had to make with the pot. Well, no, that was the hardest decision I've had to make with the podcast and blog because everybody tells you, oh no, you've got, you have to, going back to those have tos, you have to have your blog every week. You have to have a podcast every week or else nobody's going to listen to you. And to take that step back and to do that, I mean, that was one of the hardest things I've ever done actually to put myself first there and say, no, I've got to take care of myself because I'm like you, I want to do everything right now. And I want to do everything right. It has to be perfect. I really struggle with perfectionism and to recognize that. And to, like you said, step back and to start giving myself the freedom to enjoy more. And it's really helped. And like, you, yeah, I'm to the point now where I don't, I don't really get that nervous. And it's because I've done it enough times that I, I'm more comfortable with it myself. And, and that's a huge point for our listeners. Like we love that you listen to our podcast and Shannon's podcast and read the blogs and, and do all the social media, but you have to enjoy it too. It doesn't mm-hmm. help you if you're just in a room, sitting, listening and trying to consume it all. You have to be a part of it. And I love that some of our listeners have started their own podcasts. Um, they've started doing it too. But as long as you're enjoying it, (laughs) don't Mm -hmm. forget to enjoy it. And even, you know, Tom and I talked about this with social media. We're not one to to toot our horn and take pictures of what we do. And sometimes I'm so in the the zone, I'm not taking pictures of it. And I'm trying to bring that to where, all right, let's take a couple of pictures. Let's share while we're enjoying it as well, you know, to encourage other people to do it. But there's just so much to remember. (laughs) Like, I feel like I'm in a spaceship with, with, 50 buttons and levers and trying to pull them in the right order to make sure everything goes as planned and you can't plan everything. And you got to make sure that we're all doing this so that we can actually enjoy it and don't exactly. And then we go outside and we're wanting to enjoy it. And if you're like me, technology is not your forte. Uh, You really don't care that much about technology itself to begin with. You want to be outside and enjoying it and away from that technology and yet, oh yeah, I've got to remember to take these pictures and I've got to remember to do this. And po- and it's like, sometimes it's like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 such a fine, I don't know what the answer is. I struggle with that all the time. And I end mm-hmm. up flip-flopping and going both ways where I'm taking a million pictures and not enjoying it or enjoying it and forgetting to do it. I haven't found that balance yet, but hopefully, hopefully our listeners are finding that balance and yes. spreading the message, but enjoying it and, and doing it for the right reasons. And that's, that's what all this is about. Mm-hmm. So Tom, I know I've asked a million questions. <laughs> no, you've done a, done a great job. And I've, I feel like I've chimed in when I needed to. Well, I didn't know if you had anything else that you wanted to. No, not really. It was, it's nice to, to just chat, you know, it is, mm-hmm. it is. And that's what I loved about this conversation. Just much like when you had us on backyard ecology, we just had a chat. Yes. And, and I love that. So you get to, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tom. No, I, I, I might have just had like a little deeper breath. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> you. I, I, I thought you were going to say something. Um, but we always end the podcast with the simplest and hardest question of all. And, and you listen, so you know what it is, but we're going to ask you what your favorite native plant is. And I know there's no easy answer to that. And a lot of our I, I think the people that have given us easy answers have feel as if they've compromised and let themselves down by <laughs> yeah. picking 
picking one thing. So we're not going to restrain it or, or make you like stick to one thing. But if you wanted to just pick what your favorite plant is right now, or one of each category, you can give us, you can give us whatever you want. First of all, you're mean. I just want to say that you guys are horribly mean. (laughs) (laughs) That's, that's, that's half the fun of this is getting to this question and then making you pick. It's like saying, which is your favorite kid? (laughs) Yes. And I will admit that I spent, um, a decent amount of time trying to figure out how I was going to answer this question, knowing it was going to come up. (laughs) (laughs) But let's see if I had to pick. And again, I don't have a favorite. It changes every five minutes, definitely every season. I'm going to bring it down to two. Okay. One's a tree and one's a, what everybody would call a flower. Okay. Technically it's a Ford, but, (laughs) um, but yes, with the trees, I have to go sassafras, sassafras albidum. That is a great choice. I absolutely love them. Always have since I was a kid. Um, poll- um, pollinators, especially your bees, love the flowers. They're a little bitty. You're not going to notice them unless you're actually looking for them, but they just absolutely love them in that early springtime. The fruits, the birds will come in and it's so valuable for the birds. The fall color is just gorgeous. And the leaves and the shape of the leaves, I just always love them. And I tend to come towards things more from a wildlife perspective. But for those that come to plants more from a historical usage mm-hmm. perspective, and I know there's a lot of people that do that. Sassafras also has that long history of use in so many different forms by humans. I mean, it's just an amazing plant. It's not necessarily the best plant for the home landscape because they can form those suckers and they can spread and take over, but in the right place, they're amazing. And especially out in the woods, I love them. Mm -hmm. Um, It's a little scary with sassafras right now because you guys don't have it yet, but it's coming. Um, Hopefully they find a way to stop it or there's a, some breakthrough before then, but there is a fungus Actually, it's a disease caused by an introduced beetle and an introduced fungus. Um, And it's called laurel wilt disease. It was first discovered in Georgia, and I believe it was 2013. All the red base, which is a coastal plain, southern coastal plain um, plant, started dying off. And they were like, huh? Started doing the research and found a beetle that was completely unknown to science before then that had been introduced. I want to say it was from Asia, but it was introduced and it spread as a type of ambrosia beetle, which ambrosia beetles, we've got some native ones too, but this particular one um, has a fungus associated with all the ambrosia beetles have a fungus associated, but this one's introduced beetle, introduced fungus, and they inoculate the trees, actually drill a little hole in the tree and they inoculate with a fungus that then begins to grow and the eggs once the eggs of this beetle hatch the larva will eat the fungus so they're basically for um, fungal farmers Mm -hmm. um, and a beetle um, range but that fungus kills plants in the laurel family Mm -hmm. so it pretty much wiped out a lot of the red bays down south then it jumped to the sassafras because sassafras are also in the Laurel Lacey family. It's now, so it's in Kentucky now, and it's really in the areas where it's been found, it's especially for after two or three years, it's bad. It's really bad. It's starting to jump into the spice bushes, uh, which again is another problem, but yeah, so it's spreading and they're trying to figure out what in the world to do now, but it's a scary situation with that that's a real shame because that's one of the trees i always like get really happy about when i find it in the woods just Mm -hmm. the the different leaves there's really it's just as simple it's a great tree to introduce to kids just because of the different leaves that it has i was gonna say it's a and then the smell you can get all the senses in there it it is a great teaching tree and not like hey look this tree has three different leaves it's hey take a look at this tree and tell me what's unique about it what's different about this tree Mm -hmm. 
and the discovery of that is wonderful. It's a it's a great tree for that purpose. And, and like you said, the the scent and all the stories behind it, it's a wonderful tree. Some one of our listeners uh, on the buzz last week actually mentioned we should do an episode on invasive mm-hmm. bugs, and that's yeah. another one. You know, there's so many, and we kind of always mention them, mm-hmm. but I think it it's an important message how all these invasive insects get here and the damage that they're doing. Yes. It's probably a great idea to maybe do a, a topic of a buzz episode of just, hey, these are the 10 worst invasive bugs, and this is how they got here, and this is what they're doing. Yes, and um, when you do to that one, yeah. let me know, and I'll definitely promote it among my audience okay. too, because I get a lot of questions for that too. In fact, one of the ones I want to do next coming up into 2022 is I want to do a spotted lantern fly because they're not in Kentucky yet, but I know they're in Ohio. They're up where you guys are. They're definitely in the Eastern U S and I want to do learn more about those and get that information out there as well. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, we have them here and you see them, but it's not overwhelming, but I've been to places where it's overwhelming and mm-hmm. it's, it looks like an apocalypse, uh, wow. like apocalypse insect. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, all right. And you have a forb also, what is your forb? Yes. And that is cup plant, Silphium perculatum. I do not know that one. Oh, I don't, well, Bonap has it as being native to the entire Eastern U S okay. It's more prevalent, much more prevalent in, um, in the Midwest. Okay. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it can be, and it's one of those that I really talk more people out. People want to buy it when they hear me talk about it. And I end up talking them out of it 99% of the time or really trying to talk them out of it because it can spread like crazy. It's a very aggressive plant, at least where I'm at in Kentucky. And I've heard stories of it in other areas too. So I know it's not just here now, whether more Midwest, it's not as aggressive um, or it's just that it's in more of the prairie land. So it is in with more competitive species. So it just doesn't show those aggressiveness tendencies like it does in our gardens. That's another question. But yeah, I love cup plant because it's in the um, sunflower family. It's with the sunflowers. It's a very close, silphiums are very close relatives to helianthus sunflowers. And so it's got all these little yellow flowers on it in July, August, sometimes early September, but more in that July, August time frame. And every bee in the world will be on it. Every butterfly there is will be on it. I mean, I've had monarchs and Eastern tiger swallowtails practically fighting over the same blossom before. It's just so much fun. And then it's called cup plant because the leaves, they come around the stem and they actually form a watertight cup around the stem. So when we get the rains, when we get those heavy dews, you get water there Hmm. and the birds will come in and they'll drink and the pollinators will come in and they'll drink. You'll get great tree frogs kind of sitting in there with the looking out at you. I mean, it's just awesome there. And then once they go to seed, oh my gosh, the goldfinches come in. They absolutely go crazy over the seeds. They spread them everywhere. You get it popping up everywhere. It will take over. Like I said, it's highly aggressive. Um, It's actually completely overtaken the bed that I put it in because I didn't realize how aggressive it was when I put it there. And then I kind of, once I saw it taking over, I was like, ooh. I also had um, rough sunflower there as well. And I was like, okay. And it was starting to take over. So I was like, okay, which one's going to take over? So I was just letting them tug a war it out and see yeah. what happened. Well, cut plants taken over. It jumped out of that bed and got into another area. That's a little bit wilder that um, has Johnson grass in it and it's holding its own against Johnson grass. Now, I don't know how much Johnson grass you guys have up there, but around here, Johnson grass is a bane for any sort of prairie barrens pollinator conservation area. My cup plant's holding its own. It's not taking out the Johnson grass, but it's holding its own against it. I'm like, awesome. oh, okay. That tells me something right there. Well, I definitely have to look this one up because I don't know it. And I'm yeah. wondering if it's one that once I see it, I'll be like, oh, okay. I know what it is, but yeah, it's it. some, I've, I've heard of it before, but I've never, I've never seen it in, that I knew what it was. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I actually looked it up before coming on the podcast with you 
because I couldn't remember whether it was considered native all the way up and over to New Jersey or not. And Bonap says it is, but in my mind, when I was thinking, I was thinking, no, it's not, doesn't go that far east and north, but according to Bonap, it does. So we'll go with that. <laughs> all right. And it's, it's probably, I pulled up a picture and it looks like, it kind of looks, at least in the picture I'm looking at, it looks kind of like Heliopsis and some, okay. other, <laughs> some other things that if I was walking by, I wouldn't have maybe distinguished it from, and I was, oh, that's what it is, but. It's from an online picture. The flowers, yes, the flowers do look very helianthus or heliopsis looking. And that's what I said. It's a very, yeah. very close relative to it. Yeah. But once you see the stem, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll have to keep that in mind next time I'm awesome. walking around. I learned something new today. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. I love oh, yeah. this. <laughs> all right. So we always end with um, the final thoughts. So this is where we give you the floor. We give you a minute or two. You can use it however you want. You can promote, you can summarize, you can bring up something that we didn't talk about, but we hand it over to you and you can use it any way you'd like. The floor is yours. Thanks. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you guys so much. I really appreciate you having me on here and I appreciate all that you guys do with helping to let us all know about other organizations, other groups, other people doing it, forming those connections. Um, we were talking earlier about being aware of the community out there. You guys are part of the matchmakers. You help to form those connections. And that is so, so very valuable. And I really appreciate all the work you guys do for that. Thank you. We can maybe make that song from Fiddler on the Roof, our new theme song, friend. <laughs> new theme music, oh, right? Yeah. And the, what they have the match. Is, am I thinking of the right play? I only oh, saw yes, you are. it when she was in high school when I was like, <laughs> 15 years old. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, that is, thank you very much. We appreciate that. That's our new theme music. We'll have to pull it out for the next. Yeah. I got to get the sound bite. <laughs> um, Tom, would you like to go? Or would you like me to go? Yeah. And I actually have a uh, final thoughts, not thought. Okay. Um, the first one is, so we talk about, we talked about how nature's in your backyard and then like where you would want to live. And this weekend, uh, which I, some, I did something I wanted to do all summer, which was go out on the boat and do some crabbing uh, in the bay. And um, yeah, it's just interesting seeing those kind of plant communities. Now we, I go down there to, to, well, as a nursery, we go down there to collect a lot of seeds. So I've been in that area a bunch to collect Spartina alternate flora seed. And we just took the boat and went out and brought my 15 month old son out and first time ever being on a boat and he did great and got some crabs came and brought him home for dinner but that's nature and now it's not directly in our backyard but it was an hour drive to mm -hmm. to get down there so it's in our area and um reflecting back on where i'd want to live like yeah that's i i've been to kentucky and i loved kentucky yeah when i drove through it the one thing that's missing from kentucky was salt water <laughs> I do like going saltwater fishing and crabbing and clamming and doing those kind of things. Um, but it's important to recognize those areas in your backyard, whether it's an hour drive away or, or something like that. Those things that are right there. And when we think about going to those wild places, even in North America, well, you're thinking about going to Yosemite and, and Grand Teton and, and Yellowstone. They're all out west. But we have some really amazing places here on the East Coast as well that aren't necessarily even national parks. They're just cool areas to go. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to keep that in mind that nature is right in your backyard. There's some really cool things right here. If you were just walk outside, you can find something really cool within a matter of minutes. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is weird. You, Shannon, you already probably had already probably already had your pawpaw season. Ours is like in peak right now. And um, and if you haven't tried a pawpaw and you're in New Jersey, specifically central New Jersey, I would check out, uh, there's a friend of mine who's a farmer called uh, Robeson's Farm, and they actually have an own, their own pawpaw orchard with, with pawpaw varieties. You can cultivar as a pawpaw. So there's some different uh, fruits and different flavors that you can get there. But they have a market in Wrightstown, New Jersey, and then they go to a couple different farmer's markets in the state. Now, you're only going to be able to do this probably this weekend, next weekend, and maybe one more. It's a really short window. But if you're interested in trying a pawpaw, I would find out where they're going to go. I know they do some stuff in Burlington County where we are. And then I think they do a couple things down the shore area near like Point Pleasant or, or Asbury Park. So if you haven't had a pawpaw and you don't have a pawpaw tree that you can frequent and go and get pawpaws, 
go visit wherever farmer's yes. market she's at and pick some up because you'll you'll definitely enjoy them totally so, totally did i awesome. steal your final thought was no that, was that no, your <laughs> not at all my final thought's different we're not even overlapping today actually maybe a little bit but that's a great final thought um uh, mine is there's special places everywhere even outside your door so when the podcast is over not right now because we're almost done hang in there we got five more minutes <laughs> five more minutes when you hear keep it native and you hear our our ending theme music turn the podcast off unplug walk outside leave your phone in the house go enjoy nature look around observe take a blanket outside go lay in your yard just look observe a couple leaves um it's the first day of autumn right now as we're recording this mm -hmm. so colors changing uh if you're in an area where uh, you do experience a fall just go outside look at what insects are still uh floating around look at mm -hmm. look at everything just forget about forget about learning and just go experience and just go see it and then enjoy it and that's yeah. it that's my final thought just forget about all of this for a few minutes and do what you did to get interested in this in the first place and just go experience it have fun forget about us <laughs> and just just see be a part of it because you are a part of it it does it it's not us and ecology it's us it's we're us. all yes. yes so go and go be a part of it and and enjoy yeah and look at it with the wonder of a child that you used to when you were a kid don't just oh yeah that's whatever i've seen a million times but really look at it and what i found is when i do that i start to get drawn in and i see things that i didn't see before because i was too busy and just to really get drawn in to see all those little things and those details and realize that we don't know yeah a lot i mean we're still discovering new species that are literally in people's backyards, literally in the middle of downtown New York City. I, there are new species being discovered everywhere and things that we don't, don't know as much as we would think we would know. Basic life history pieces that we don't know about some of these common animals. So yes, okay. to what don't, Fran said, get out there, explore, yeah. learn, yeah. get it's engaged. Okay. It's okay to not know, go discover. Go, mm -hmm. go discover, enjoy. Yes. All right. So go. that is it. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you enjoyed listening to Shannon Tromboli from Backyard Ecology. For more information, visit www.backyardecology.net. Uh, also, I'll go on Apple Podcasts or whatever your, your podcast services and subscribe to Backyard Ecology and leave them a five-star review. I'll ask for us later, but I'll ask for them now. Leave, <laughs> leave Shannon a five-star yes. review. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Native Plants Healthy Planet presented by Pines Nursery. Uh, we're giving a big thank you to the Egocentric Plastic Men for contributing our theme music. Make sure you stream or buy their songs wherever you consume your music. Uh, Apple Music or Spotify, wherever it is, uh, go see them live. Live music is back. They perform uh, all over Philadelphia, especially in the Maniunk area. So if you're in that area and you want to see some good live music, go look them up. Follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery, Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and YouTube at Pinelands Nursery because social media is important for spreading that message. Uh, or you can call us, give us a call at the uh, question and answer line. It's 215-346-6189. Again, 215-346-6189. Uh, leave a comment, ask a question, uh, and we'll answer it to the best of our abilities in a future episode of The Buzz. Uh, if you're not a member, join the Native Plants Healthy, uh, Healthy Planet Facebook group. And did I say that right? Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. Wow. Yes. Okay. All right. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about this episode over there. And if you haven't done so, we're still taking entries for photos of Saul or for drawings or sketches of mm -hmm. Saul. Saul has yeah. submitted his own sketch of himself. Oh, that's going to be a self-portrait. Uh, yeah, self, a self-portrait. So uh, make sure you get that in. But there's no time frame. So we're, it's not like you're closing out. But but make sure you get it. In. Yeah. So uh, you can buy shirts and listen to Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. Um, if there's a banner on the top that says click here and you'll get the t-shirts. And as always, 100% of the, the profits from that are going to support the organizations um, that we have on the podcast where we just started with our first uh, donation and it went to the Salins Conservancy and then Kyle with the Native Habitat Project and, uh, and then Kyle was so excited that he put it up on his TikTok. And then all of a sudden, we got a whole bunch more yeah. T-shirts sold. And there's a ton of new yeah. new designs up and more to come. 
Yes. Oh, yeah. Fran, I'm glad you reminded me. Yes. So we have, I just added four designs over the weekend. Some that I've been sitting on that I keep at the end of the morning. Oh, I'm going to add new designs. Oh, I, I finally did it. I bought two of them. Already. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so, yeah, they're a little bit more artistic. So you might, you might like them. And, uh, and there's another one that I've been designed. It was the first, literally the first t-shirt I designed, but I'm like, I want to get permission from the person whose knowledge I kind of took to make this shirt to do it. And then all the, the funding we get from that shirt is going to go to his projects. And I finally got permission yesterday. I saw him face to face because he didn't respond to my email. And I said, Hey, do you like this? Cause we, we want to <laughs> sell it and donate all the money to you. And uh, no, he was really happy about it. So that shirt is going to launch on Monday. So you listen to this on Friday, it'll launch. Now, nah, you know what I'm going to do it on Saturday. Yeah. So sad. So you'll listen on Friday. It'll launch shortly after. And it's a great shirt. I already own one. Yes, me too. So, yeah. And we haven't, we haven't disclosed what it is yet, but yeah. it's coming. It's an awesome shirt. So, um, where was I? Oh yeah. You can always check us out on Apple podcast. Make sure you are leaving a, a five-star review and hit subscribe. It really goes a long way. And you get a shout out for me on our next fuzz episode. So and Tom does his research, finds out a lot. Yes, about. I do. I really dive deep in who's leaving his reviews <laughs> so I can give him a nice, genuine compliment. So um, as always, you can also listen on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, really wherever you consume your podcasts, go and pay attention to Shannon's podcast too. Cause it's a really, really good one. And with that, Thank you, everyone. I'm Tom. And I am Fran. Thank you again, everyone. Shannon, thank you so much for taking more of your time to, to <laughs> spend with us. Thank you. <laughs> we appreciate it. Uh, coming up next, we have a buzz episode. Maybe that one might actually be about invasive insects. Who knows? We didn't have a topic before. Yeah. Maybe that could yeah, be the topic. Be so, so we have that coming up next week. Thank you for listening again. And until then, keep it native. Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.